Roberry. I'm an associate professor of law at the Georgia State University College of Law, which is located in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States of America. Uh, I teach several courses, among which are property, natural resources law, environmental law, and legal history. In Europe, we heard a lot about uh, an article wrote by uh, Christopher, Christopher D. Stone in uh, uh, 1972 mm -hmm. uh, concerning the Mineral King uh, case. Uh, could you tell us what was the impact of this uh, academic article uh, in the US? Sure. Um, the answer itself would be very short. The uh, impact of the academic article is very minimal. Uh, in fact, growing up and studying environmental natural resources law, I had never really heard of the, Rod <laughs> the, the Stone uh, Law Review article. But what is interesting about the article is that it comes at a time in United States environmental legal history when there was a lot of questions about the environment. And so it's not surprising to me that they, that article came out when it did. And some of the reasons for that is from 1969 to 1975, you have a raft or several different environmental statutes that are created in order to protect the environment, such as the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, the Endangered Species Act of 1972, and so on and so on. And so Stone was also writing within this period when there was a lot of thought being given to how can we better protect the environment. The article itself I don't think had much of an impact, but the milieu, sort of the environmental movement that was happening in the United States has a massive impact on laws that actually are still used today to protect the environment. So more influential, I would say, than Stone's article uh, in 1972 was actually the writings of John Muir and some of the other early philosophical founders of the ecological movements in the United States. Uh, their writings actually became far more popular in the 1960s and 1970s in the idea of sort of returning to nature, respecting nature, not just exploiting nature, were far more influential in the way that people thought about how we should treat nature and the environment in the future. So again, I think Stone is sort of, sort of swimming in this tide of sort of environmental consciousness and John Muir and others from the early 20th century were far more influential in the environmental movement than, than Stone's article itself. And uh, you, you're speaking about the influence on, uh, on uh, citizens, on politics, mm -hmm. uh, but did it have a, an influence, legally speaking, on judges maybe, or You mean Stone's, Stone's article? Uh, no, the, the philosophy, yeah. The philosophy, yes. Um, where, where it had its biggest in influence in members of Congress. Uh, members of Congress and what happened was you had a lot of cities and urbanization being redeveloped people worried about the loss of nature in their urban spaces and even in some suburban spaces and this had a great effect on Congress and also the judges um, and so Congress began sort of worrying about these issues judges began worrying, worrying about these issues particularly in the western United States you have some federal and state judges who are thinking more hardly about how can we better balance environmental protection with development. Um, and that happened in the late 1960s, early 1970s as a response to sort of rapid suburban and urban expansion in the United States. And a lot of, again, Muir, then people began looking back to Muir, saying, what should we be thinking about? How should our relationship be with nature? And through his writings, you have a lot of this question of biocentrism, this idea that a biological entity has the same sort of inherent intrinsic value that a human being does. Or is a tree only supposed to be exploited or util utilized? And this question of how do we view ourselves within nature became a much more sort of hot topic in the late 60s, early 70s. And it did influence judicial decisions at the state and federal level, but most significantly with federal statutes protecting environmental, environmental issues across uh, the whole spectrum in the United States.
uh, let's go back on the, the stone uh, thinking mm -hmm. uh, because even even if you say that uh, the influence was not very not not so important uh, it remains that uh, the root of this article is a problem concerning access to justice Correct. Um, concerning a, a case in the mineral king uh, the mineral king uh, case um, where the judge said, "Okay, uh, you want to defend, you want to defend uh, trees, uh, but it's you don't, you do not have a personal interest right. uh, to do it." And I mean, the problem uh, was uh, relevant, and the answer given by Stone was quite relevant too. So, how did the U.S. Uh, deal with uh, this issue of standing of access to justice in general? Yeah, access to justice sort of was. There's two ways that the U.S. dealt with this in general. The first was in many of the environmental law statutes in the early 70s, for example, the Endangered Species Act, you have a provision in the statute called a citizen suit provision. What that says is that any citizen, you, me, an NGO, a group, a business, a citizen has the right to sue the federal agency for not protecting a particular endangered species or has the right to use the law to protect the endangered species through listing it as an endangered species. And this idea of a citizen, any normal person can use the law and can petition the federal agency to protect the endangered species opens up the access to use this law to protect the endangered species. And one of the interesting cases is a very early case in the 1970s when you had a law student from the University of Tennessee who claims that a small fish called a snail darter was endangered. And the law student, so a 23-year-old person who is not trained in law but learning law, petitions the Fish and Wildlife Service and says, you need to protect this fish. And the Fish and Wildlife Service says, okay, we will look at it. 90 days later, the fish was found. They, they said, well, this looks endangered. So they actually gave the fish legal protections on the basis of a 23-year-old petitioning them. And that is the idea of a citizen suit, is that it opens up the access to justice to anybody who could be affected. It doesn't matter who you are or what socioeconomic class you are from. That is the first way. It's called a citizen suit provision. However, there is no citizen pursuit provision in some of our other environmental statutes. And what the United States has done there is there is a, an overarching administrative statute called the Administrative Procedure Act. And that act, when there is no citizen suit provision that allows you to challenge the federal government, the Administrative Procedure Act allows any person to challenge any federal agency when they believe they have abused their discretion or they have not done what they said they should do. For this instance, if the National Park Service decides to sell off a national park to a private entity, somebody could use the Administrative Procedure Act and say, I am going to stop you from doing that because you have abused your discretion and although there is no specific statute that says I can sue you, I will use the overarching statute from the Administrative Procedure Act as a way to access justice. Um, it does need to be set, so access to justice can be either be statute specific in the United States or it can be general. You still have to prove standing. Standing is still a requirement. Now standing in the United States means that there needs to have been some sort of personal harm but that has been construed very broadly. For instance, if you are going to stop someone from cutting down some trees in a particular area, it is enough if you go hiking or jogging through the forest and you could say, this would be a personal injury to me. I'm getting oxygen from the trees or it creates beauty, gives me a sense of well-being. Then you have a personal interest actually in those trees. But you cannot have someone, say, who lives in Oregon suing somebody in California for cutting down trees in California when there is no personal connection. So it is interpreted broadly, but there must be a personal connection, which means that typically NGOs or other groups who want to use environmental law, they, they find members who live in that particular area, and that member 
is the person who brings the suit against the agency or against the, the private developer saying, this actually harms me because I live here. I live in the area or I am a frequent visitor to the area, therefore I do have standing. And if you do that, that is enough. The courts will hear your case. So standing is, is very broad. There must be some connection, uh, but it is a very broad-based connection. Okay, so if we go back to the, um, the Mineral King case, mm -hmm. uh, the NGO was the, the Sierra Club at that time. Yep. Uh, if it would happen now, if Walt Disney would uh, build a ski <laughs> resort, because that yeah. time it was Disney, uh, yeah. uh, you think that the Sierra, Club, the Sierra Club could easily go to court? Easily, easily, because the Sierra Club has, I mean, they're a very large NGO. Uh, they have members all over in all 50 states, and they would have people in the area, and they would say, you need to go to that area, and they might already have members who hike or live or work near that area and they would say just go there and then we will use you as the plaintiff in the case and this is the this is the tactic that is used all the time and it's a perfectly suitable tactic that they said we have members of our community who are affected therefore as an NGO we may bring a suit on behalf of our members this happens all the time in the United States okay that's that's good news um... So maybe the maybe we can go to another um, uh, topic included in the in the rights of nature mm -hmm. uh, discourse. Uh, first, uh, it is supposed to improve uh, access to justice for the guardians, uh, but um, as I understand, uh, this uh, this kind of argument is not. Um, uh, very relevant uh, nowadays mm -hmm. uh, but the other argument from uh, the rights of nature supporters is uh, that environmental law uh, is not protecting uh, the intrinsic value of, uh, of nature they pretend uh, that law in general and, and environmental law uh, in particular is just like anthropocentric yeah. um, what would you what do you think about that kind of uh, of questions uh, regarding US law US law I mean I would US law is broadly based it is a utilitarian based law it is sort of what is the use vis-a-vis -vis human beings um, so inherent rights of nature um, I wouldn't say that we are completely exploitative in the United States um, but inherent rights of nature the question is who also defines those rights. The trees don't speak, at least not a language that we hear necessarily, so can the trees, so essentially we are placing on the trees some sort of intrinsic value that we human beings see. Um, and so to some extent there's no way to really answer that question about what is the intrinsic value of a tree, because the tree itself would have to answer that question. We can't answer that question, so on one hand there's that. On the other hand, I think U.S. law through the National Park Service, through wilderness areas, through the different statutes and laws that we have created, there is a becoming a broader based recognition that there is value in nature that we cannot legally comprehend necessarily. And therefore, because we cannot legally comprehend all of the values, perhaps we should save it. You know, maybe, maybe, because maybe in the future we'll think of something different that will have a better system. Um, but we are still very much a utilitarian based legal system inherent rights the hard part is when you have inherent rights also is inherent if everything has inherent rights when there is a tension and a clash how do you then decide whose inherent rights are superior or whose inherent rights must give way to the other um, and that is really also at the heart of the legal system is dealing with disputes um, and so inherent rights we typically Nature, if there's a question of will a human being die or will a tree die, it will be the tree in the United States because we, we value the inherent right of human life over that of a tree, even though the tree is also living. The challenge then also becomes defining nature itself. If you're going to say all nature has inherent rights, that sounds great to me. Is it living nature? What about rocks? Do rocks have rights? Do, are they, or do they have lesser rights than, say, grass? 
Um, you're trying to say what uh, it, someone is going to have to define and set decide what is nature and what is not nature. And that is a very, very difficult question because in different cultures around the world, you have different conceptions of what nature is. And that will necessarily change what you think the rights of nature should be. Um, in the United States, we're very sort of Judeo-Christian, Anglo, it's Anglo-American law, which is heavily based on biblical tradition. And those biblical traditions, you know, when you go back to the book of Genesis in the Bible, Adam, God says to Adam and Eve, you know, have dominion over the earth, subdue it, you know, work the land. And that, those kind of philosophies of use the land, take care of it, but use it. This idea of stewardship, but stewardship through use is very, very powerful in the United States legal system. And stewardship doesn't mean exploit, but it also doesn't mean leave completely alone. And so it's finding this, this tension and sort of managing this tension between use and overuse that is sort of at the hallmark of the United States legal system. So I find it challenging to talk about inherent rights of nature uh, when I think it's very difficult for us to define what those rights are and how they would even be protected since nature does not speak for itself in our legal systems and we already have NGOs, courts, statutes, other methods of protecting the environment, what sort of, what would be the additional advantages of crafting a rights of nature when we already have those same sort of protections built in, we just don't call them uh, rights of nature. So I, I find it a challenging question and one that would require a lot of upfront definition about what you mean and then how you would actually then protect and enforce those rights against competing forces. But would you say that uh, nature conservation law in the US uh, is in some ways um, uh, dealing with the idea that humans are depending of uh, nature and, and thus as we are interdependent, uh, we have to protect nature because you mentioned the Bible and, and all yeah. everyone knows uh, uh, that it inspired a kind of domination of nature. Right. But, um, do you think the, the idea of interdependence can be seen into a positive law at the moment? Uh, yes, they're actually, I mean, I would, if you ask me that, well, I'm not that old, but if you ask me 40 years ago, I would say no. <laughs> but I, today I would say there's a growing movement of this consciousness of interdependence and how it actually manifests itself in U.S. legal um, decision-making. For example, there are many cities in the United States that are considering what are called ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the natural product, product of the environment around you and the benefit that they provide, such as marshlands are act as a natural water filtration device. If we remove those marshlands and try to put in a water cleaning pump, how much would it cost to do the same thing that nature does on its own? So there are many, you know, there, and they are taking this idea of ecosystem services and this knowledge of interdependence and using it in town planning, saying if you are going to remove this marshland, or if you are going to remove these trees, there is an additional added penalty because we will be losing some of the natural gifts and interdependence that we get from the forest or from the marshland. And you find that particularly at the local level. You're also finding it on the large scale habitat level through the Endangered Species Act. There is what is now called a habitat conservation plan. And those are expanding as we realize that the habitats for large predators or butterflies, the habitats are much larger than we once realized. We're realizing the interdependence of not just the species and a particular plant, but perhaps also predators or prey or particular types of water systems. And we are preserving wider and wider areas of land because we're realizing more and more how everything works together to create an equilibrium. And that is happening under the Endangered Species Act 
in California at the moment. They are preserving Riverside County, which is a large county in California. They're looking at creating this massive habitat conservation plan, which will then preserve many different types of species, many different types of landscapes, water. It will challenge also where development of human habitation can go in a way to sort of help not undermine the interdependence that we have on, 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 on the environment. So this is actually happening very, very quickly in the United States. And you also see it with fracking, where, where states or cities are banning the use of extracting fossil fuels um, because they realize also there could be some very bad effects from doing that and that we have an inter... There is a relationship. Uh, and climate change is the other instance. You have, although our federal government does not recognize that climate change is real, you, are, you have New York and some other cities, particularly in California and Oregon, who are through law setting up positive law recommendations and sort of penalties for producing fossil fuels over a certain amount or for um, certain gas tailpipe emissions from the cars how many cars can go in a certain place a day. Um, but those are done at the local and state level because the federal government, again, does not believe in climate change, although many states and local governments do. They are changing their laws as they recognize the interdependence on particular environmental factors. Uh, so it's changing right now. You mentioned um, large predator, predators, mm -hmm. um, and in the news recently, we we have heard uh, from Europe that in the U.S. the large predators' uh, status is uh, quite changing. Uh, the, the federal administration seems to uh, to lower the protection, but we also have heard about a judicial decision maintaining the protection. Can you? Uh, make it clear for us? Sure, I'll, I, you know, it's hard sometimes to make sense of anything judges or the federal government says, but uh, I'll, I will do my best. Um, the situation deals with wolves. Uh, wolves in the west, in uh, what's called Yellowstone National Park, which is one of the largest national parks in the United States. It spans two states, Idaho and Wyoming. Um, it's gorgeous. I grew up about 30 minutes away from Yellowstone as a boy. So I've been to Yellowstone. When I was in Yellowstone as a boy, there were you, you never saw a bear and you never saw a wolf because in the early 1980s when I was there, those predators had largely been killed off or died from disease or were just, they were not present in the park. Lots of buffalo or bison, lots of deer. And what they noticed was that with, without bears and wolves, the deer population and the bison population just exploded and nothing could keep it in check. And they began eating everything in the, in the park because there was no natural check upon, those, upon the deer or the bison. And they even began leaving the park and eating up all the crops of, of private landowners near the park. And so the decision was made to reintroduce bears, wolves, um, back into Yellowstone Park. The wolf has been controversial because they've actually survived. They've been taking off, they've been breeding, they've been growing. The challenge with a wolf or with a bear, or any sort of animal for that matter, is that they don't stay within jurisdictional boundaries. So they, they don't stop at the boundary of the park because there is no fence. And so they don't stop, they actually leave the, leave the park. And the question now is, with so many wolves in back into the park, a lot of the wolves are leaving and attacking sheep or other animals on private landowners' property and then returning to the park. Uh, where they are protected. Now the challenge is then a private landowner, if they're protecting their sheep, will want to kill the wolf. The wolf had been endangered, which means they had special legal protections, but then that, that classification of endangered had been removed because it had been felt there were, there were enough wolves that they were no longer threatened with extinction. Um, that is sort of what is at play here in that this That was a, a scientific decision? A scientific decision. So you would have scientists from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who would go out and study how many wolves there were. Were there young wolves? Were there old wolves? Were, they, were there how many kills they could find? And on the basis of those scientific discoveries and papers, they would make a decision on is the wolf endangered? Is it, is it being threatened with extinction? Or 
has it recovered enough that we can remove it from these legal protections? And so that is really where the fight is, is has the wolf recovered enough that it no longer needs these legal protections? Uh, the federal administration says, yeah, the wolf has recovered enough, it no longer needs these protections, whereas biologists and scientists are saying it is not there yet. It still needs some protections in order to thrive in a way that we know can be sustainable. And that really is what's at the heart of this question at the moment. Uh, the real challenge behind it is the scientific uncertainty of how many wolves, no one knows how many wolves there actually are, and so a lot of it is educated guesswork, um, but all of these policy decisions from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are made only after scientists, scientific studies have been made. They're not perfect, the scientific studies, but they do sort of give a direction on which way they are heading. And the Fish and Wildlife Service employs many biologists and scientists uh, whose job it is to actually take care of these species and to figure out how they're doing. So we are not at the end of the case, is what I want to say. Uh, this will continue to go on and until sort of the federal administration and the biologists and sci scientists from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are probably on the same page. Um, and it will always be a challenge again because wolves, bears, bison, they always leave the park and so there's always going to be complaints from private landowners about how should we manage resources, if you can call animals resources, that move because they don't stick around. They, they move all over the place, and how do you then manage them? One way is to put up a fence. Now, that will never happen at Yellowstone. It's too big, too big of a place, uh, and many people don't want to see a fence because that also restricts animals in different ways. Um, so the, the last chapter in this saga has not, been, has not been written. You will see more of this. The last question is about um, a proposal uh, that uh, is not published yet as, as far as I know, but uh, um, we have some uh, colleagues, uh, Guillaume Chaperon and uh, Jaffa Epstein, in, uh, that are, who are, uh, the first one is a scientist, an ecologist, and the second one is a lawyer. Uh, and they are thinking about uh, um, something more concrete uh, than rights of nature theory, mm -hmm. uh, but that is in line with rights of nature. Uh, they are wondering uh, what if we just write in statutes, in a statute, that, for example, a species is the owner of uh, its habitat. Ah, okay. uh, that means that the species is a legal person mm -hmm. and as a legal person can be the ownership of a land okay so i thought about this because you spoke about the relation between species protection and habitat protection mm -hmm. um, what what did you that's an interesting think question. about this I, I think the challenge i mean i take a look at united states law and we have some of the strongest private property rights in the entire globe uh, but those property rights themselves are still limited. There are challenges. You cannot use your property as you see fit. Giving sort of legal status or personhood to a tree and saying the tree is the owner of the habitat, the challenge, in e this is still the exact same challenge we find with environmental law in the United States today, is enforcement. Who is going to enforce those rights? The tree cannot speak for itself, at least in our courts. Maybe, in a, I don't know if other people can speak to trees, but the challenge is going to be is saying, how is that going to work in reality? That might be a nice theory, but enforcing that, you're still going to have to have a human uh, or some human organization behind it, which we already have, at least in the United States. We have many, many different NGOs who protect different types of environmental issues and, and species. And pretty much they are already the guardians of those particular species. And so conferring stat legal personhood upon the, a tree or nature, I'm not quite sure what that would mean in reality, uh, because in reality you would still be forced back into a human paradigm with human courts and human enforcement, which although it's not perfect, and it will probably never be perfect, um, you're still at the same place where current environmental law already has you. So I'm not quite seeing what the value of it would be.
Uh, okay, uh, but imagine that uh, if we go back to Yellowstone, mm -hmm. um, imagine that uh, we give a property title to the wolf mm -hmm. on the Yellowstone, for example. Uh, I think that could work. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, the wolf is moving. Mm -hmm. So by definition, if the wolf is moving, its uh, habitats are moving. So it comes to, as you mentioned, to private land. Yeah. Uh, and that's funny to imagine that <laughs> we would need to expropriate uh, farmers <laughs> yeah. to give the property title to the, to the wolf. It, yeah, it, it, one of the challenges of dealing with moving resources is that they move. Land is stable and you can set up jurisdictional boundaries. And if you want to give property to a moving entity, that is extremely problematic for private property owners or for, or for towns or for cities. Imagine if you give a goose who flies into a city and when the goose flies into the park or a goose flies into a backyard or on top of a building, suddenly that space belongs to the goose. Uh, that can be very, very problematic. What happens if the goose, um, I don't know, pecks a child? <laughs> pecks a child on the face, commits a tort, essentially, on, on the child when the goose is in your town. Um, how will you then prosecute the goose? Uh, if the goose is an owner of property, can the goose also be an owner of its actions and criminal, in a criminal sense? So you, you kind of have this, we say slippery slope in English. You know, the question is, is how broad will the rights be? If you're going to confer least legal personhood on an animal or a tree, will you give them all of the rights that humans enjoy? Uh, if not, why are, you giving you, why are you giving them less rights than humans enjoy? Uh, that I see as, as another challenge uh, in, in this particular context. I think it's interesting to think about the challenge in the United States is also going to be jurisdictional. Um, who is going to, where is that right going to be prosecuted? Is it the local level? Is it the federal level? Is it the state level? And jurisdiction is static, stays in the same place. Yeah. And if we talk about property with a moving animal, then the jurisdiction would be moving. Um, the closest thing I know to that actually is, funny enough, is actually a medieval concept from medieval England. They had what's called the court of the verge, which meant that they, when the king was moving around within 12 miles of the king, there was essentially draw a circle from wherever the king is, and within 12 miles from the king, there is a special court designed to deal with any infractions within that 12 miles, and it was a moving jurisdiction. Um, so they did have it, but the court was also moving with the king, so it could be quickly prosecuted and things like that. Um, so there's, those are just some of the few of the challenges that I see to, to this concept, at least given United States uh, legal theory at the moment. But I, I mean, you, you are the perfect example that it's always useful to speak with a uh, legal uh, historian because they all, <laughs> always have very interesting uh, examples. But the, the last little thing uh, would be um, some of the uh, supporters of rights of nature, mm -hmm. uh, they answer the, the, that kind of question, saying, okay, we are, we are recognizing the, uh, that a species is a legal person, for example, but we are not obliged to give it all the rights and duties. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the case of the goose, uh, we could admit that it has a right to live uh, but uh, cannot be prosecuted uh, if something is wrong. Um, so that, that's uh, um, hmm. part of, the, of an answer to, to what you mentioned. Um, and that's the same about uh, Wolf's property. Yeah. Uh, we could imagine that they have property, but in a low uh, sense, mm -hmm. uh, not an absolute sense of... Right. Uh, of property, but I mean that in that case, um, if they just have not full property, but the right to use their habitat, mm -hmm. uh, 
that would be very close to very close to existing law. Yeah, um, if they had the if they had a right of use, essentially what we would call a servitude or an easement mm. for wherever wherever they went, we already have those. Uh, in you don't necessarily need to create a what is a, maybe perhaps a new system of law. We already have existing mechanisms to deal with that in. Uh, through our conservation easement programs. Um, you could use existing tools and just broaden them a bit and attach them to, to an animal that's moving if you wanted to move to go in that way. Uh, but you don't, I mean, I, I think nature, it, we are learning more and more about how interconnected we are with nature. And I feel that the legal tools we have at the moment um, are enough. And, and, and you can use those same legal tools and you can accomplish the same idea of preserving and protecting uh, nature with the existing legal, legal tools that we have. Um, the challenge will always be enforcement. We never have enough enforcement. We never have timely enforcement. Um, and that is always going to be the sticking point. And there's a wonderful saying that there is no right without a remedy. And if you cannot enforce, if you cannot enforce the right, do you truly have a right? I mean, that's partly a philosophical question, but it's a good question to ask. If you cannot enforce environmental litigation or environmental concepts or the right to nature, if you cannot enforce it, does the right really exist at all? Or is it just more of a theory? Um, and I think that really is the challenge for US law, as well as I imagine law elsewhere in the world, is this challenge of enforcement, of being making sure it's timely, making sure it's equitable, and that justice is done. We don't do a very good job with it here in the United States, and I imagine it might be the same place in many other places around the world, but that is the big sticking point.